was I, oh my oh my oh there's twists and turns oh isn't there oh there's twists and turns i i don't know where we pledge ourselves at this point we've got the shifting tier list of character love is ever evolving my friends of course king snow reigning supreme at the top uh there's a lot to talk about today i had a huge play session uh the last time and it was about nine hours of getting into this so we're going to cover a little bit i'm going to be a little vague and skip over a lot obviously but our continuing series of looking at ff13 and taking it for what it's worth without like knowing before going in as much as possible it's just an it's it's a constant change of opinion <laughs> every single every single 10 minutes the opinion can shift so let's get into it shall we uh our journey continued on with our party being all separated and that's going to continue my theory here is they wanted you to play with pretty much every different combination of two players it's clearly designed around having three in your party to really push you to understand the paradigm system of being able to change the roles of the party. This is an evolution of 10 more than anything else. Although it's like a growth of 12, it's really more of a merging of 12 and 10 together, which makes sense as 11 was an MMO. And people adored 10. 10 is, what is so far the best combat system in any of the single player FF games. And people wanted more of that, less of 12, but they still had the ATB system, and so we have this. And it's growing into something fantastic, I want to say that. But in terms of gameplay, they they must have worried that people aren't going to utilize this properly. They're going to go with like their standard team and just do whatever. And so what they've decided to do for the story purposes, for a good chunk of the game is divide them up so you'll have snow and hope you'll have lightning and hope but then you'll get saz and vanilla but then you'll get lightning and saz but then you'll get snow and vanilla and you'll they'll keep shifting the story around and changing your battle team so that you're not they're forcing on you not to be set in stone which is kind of what they did in final fantasy 4 where they're like we're going to remove a player even though you've probably put a good investment into them uh, in order to force you to shake things up and try different things out and try different jobs for all intents and purposes, although jobs are a little different in FF13. Uh, so that was interesting because I kind of agree with it. <laughs> now, I got some combos that I thought, I don't know how to make this work. It's just not working for me. One of them was Saz and uh, Vanille. Like, comparative to having Lightning and someone else in the team, they just felt infinitely worse until you adapt to their play style of like, okay, we really need you to know how good debuffing is with the saboteur role that Vanilla has. Her D shell and D protect are like 100% more damage, if not more. And that will scale up during stagger, which means you're able to do horrendously huge amounts of damage during stagger windows once you get there. So you need to be aware of being able to debuff these enemies in a very effective way and then punishing them with like a double ravager setup and if you're not sure what any of these things are I'll, i'm just going to do this very briefly is you have an, a number of roles each each character has like so far for me they have three different roles they can fulfill they can either be uh, and there's more roles but each one can only do three of the, of the, the set you can have a commando this is your main dpser and also with a commander in the group a commando it means their stagger bar will decay slower. If you do not have a, cam a commando on the team and has attacked that target, once you DPS them and the, the stagger bar fills up, it will just decay very rapidly. And you won't be able to generally, unless they're very weak enemies, reach stagger because it'll just decay too fast. Then you have Ravagers. Ravagers are also DPSs, but their general goal is to hit very quickly and their spells are modified so they do a lot of stagger multiplier. So the combo is a commando will keep the stagger bar from decaying quickly, but it won't fill it too much. A ravager will fill the stagger bar very quickly. And during stagger, it will also uh, add the multiplier more effectively. So your damage gets multiplied during the stagger window. So you want ravagers attacking during the stagger window, although they generally, it's up in the air, will do less damage than a commando during the stagger window. However, the, the stagger window bar decay effect during stagger itself is not affected by commandos they're affected by sentinels which are your tanking uh your tanking spec and snow so far is the only person uh, no snow and fang who's a new character we'll get to can be sentinels they can actually taunt enemies and they can shield guard and they can protect people from taking obscene amounts of damage for super attacks 
And their role during the stack, they don't really contribute much to the stagger. Like actually building it up and initiating stagger. But once stagger has happened, they will very much slow the decay during the stagger. So you get to stay in the stagger window for much, much longer and do much more, more damage. What I haven't scienced yet is, is having more ravagers or commandos better than, and he gets very min maxi here than having a sentinel who does less damage but causes the bar to decay. That will be something I figure out over the next few hours. Um, and you also have medics. Their job's obvious. They will throw out heals. Uh, and also then you have saboteurs. Saboteurs are debuffers. They will actively, like, debuff the enemy. They will not only, like, deprotect sounds like it removes protect. It's actually a physical damage taken buff. Uh, so you want, and they can poison as well, at least so far. So they can put poison debuff, and they can make them more vulnerable to magic damage and more vulnerable to physical damage. And on top of that, we then have synergizers. Synergizers are buffers, like bards, essentially. They will actually actively put protect on you. They will put on uh, shell. They will put on weapon enchants on you. So if this enemy is vulnerable to lightning, they will enthunder your weapons. So your attacks now do bonus thunder damage, for example. Uh, and they will also have uh, a magical resistance buff so if they know after you've done libra and scan the enemy and this enemy does a lot of fire damage they will actively put on you a fire protection buff and that's what they will do so you have all these combos and the, the idea of the paradigm system is you can set up combos i want this person to be commando and synergizer commando and medic maybe i want these to be double ravagers and actively in combat you will be swapping the paradigms a lot especially in hard fights you will be really constantly shifting this is awesome it's so fun. It's incredibly fast-paced. You also have to manage your ATB gauge. You can mindlessly do it during trash farms like you can in any FF game. But when you're doing a complicated fight, and I fought some really hard enemies this time around. I fought these flying birds that the game actively gave the option not to fight because they're quite tough. And it gave me this weird orb that could change the weather system. So they only appear in sunlight. But if you make it rain, these enemies will disappear because they're pretty tough. And then a dual uh, shard scale boss fight where they were enraging, they were sucking the buffs off you, they were removing their debuffs, and you had to manage this with Saz. Uh, like I said, at first, Saz and Vanille, I just couldn't get fights done quick enough. It was constantly getting like three stars. I was like, my DPS is low. And I did not appreciate at all how powerful D Shell and D Protect are. And then I really heavily invested into magic damage for both of them, upgraded their weapons, upgraded their accessories. Those two, when they hit a stagger window and go double Ravager, hit far harder than anything else in the game. Uh, I, I would say we will see something like Hope hitting for like 300 damage. Uh, and in stagger window, maybe a K. Whereas Saz and Vanille in a stagger window where they've got D-Shell on and also he's applied like Faith and things like that, which is a magic buff. They will hit like 3K plus easily they like absolutely wreck and so once i learned that i was like oh we can this is really fun now because i can like go 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 and push and they will just do massive amounts of damage uh so i felt like a raid leader and that was a wonderful feeling through the combat it's like it felt like a raid leader is like okay phase two is coming and you actively start learning the mechanics of the fight in the brief window you're fighting them, like if they have some sort of huge AoE coming, right, so I can actually prepare for this by pre-healing, so I'll swap to say Commando and Medic, and I'm also going to manage this with the Stagger Bar, because what I want to do is if I'm approaching Stagger, is I want to make sure the team is healed, because we're likely to get a huge offensive spell from the enemy afterwards, pre-healed, because we're going to hit the Stagger, where we're going to go like either Commando Ravager or Double Ravager, massive amounts of damage during the Stagger window, but then be defensively prepared for what's coming next. So good. Uh, prepare, and I think the extra element of this is there are fights now that are getting quite tough and that means that you can't just sit around and wait for the buffs to go out. So if you've got a good synergizer who's going to put up faith, bravery, and some protection spells, uh, is you you want... They, that takes quite a few turns to put out. It requires a lot of ATP gauge. So you're going to have to do it in pieces and manage the buffs and debuffs that are going out. It's like, okay, we'll go to... Uh, synergizer and saboteur for now to get the buffs and things up then we're gonna have to go commando and healer for a second while we heal up but then we need to swap back to those to finish getting our buffs up because we're going to push now for the stagger window uh now the debuffs are on what's really cool is the debuffs that you put on like dc D protect and d shell don't always land so now i'm getting weapons that have modifiers depending on how you want to play so i found a good weapon for vanille that increases the chance of her debuffs landing because you can spend many turns trying to get D shell and say poison on because I was magic based I don't really care about D protect 
And in that instance, I really want to make sure we're settled properly and quickly. And landing the debuffs actually feels quite satisfactory. It's like, boom, this guy is open for attack. Let's punish it. So far, the combat, the combat system is just getting better and better and better. Uh, the only one I'm really tricky with is Sentinel. And the way they teach you that is pairing up Snow and Hope. Hope is extraordinarily weak and Snow is a tank. And the, they had some bikes that did Gatling Gun. And the way to play is you can't just sit in Sentinel. It just doesn't do any damage, right? And Hope doesn't do enough damage to get them into a stagger window. So you have this p point of going like Commando and Ravager or Commando and Medic. Uh, or Commando and Synergizer so that Hope can put protect and shell on people. Uh, but when you see the Gatling Gun uh, prompt popping up over that enemy, is you need to swap very quickly to Sentinel uh, and taunt that enemy and put up a Vendetta so that he will taunt it there. And taunt doesn't always land, which is what I found towards the end. And I just had to watch Hope get mulled into the floor. Combat system, great. Enjoying it, loving it, really cool. Let's talk about the story then, because this is getting wild, dude. This is getting so wild. It's so dramatic. It's so teen. It's everything. Uh, it's everything that it set out to do at the beginning of the game. And <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, the the, con the congruent stories that are running is that Hope wants to kill Snow, the king. Nobody kills Snow because he's too cool. Uh, because he blames him for the death of his mother. And the way this plays out is they pair Hope with Lightning for quite a period of time, uh, where. Hope expresses this to Lightning, and Ho Lightning tries to reason with him. This like Ho Snow didn't kill your parent, uh, your mother. The 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 Psycoms did. They're the ones that are responsible. You should direct your anger there. And he's like, "What do you mean? No, it's Snow. He's smiling. He's happy." Uh, and Snow has a lot of dialogue that obviously it's intentional by the writers but it comes across unintentionally is what it's supposed to do keep having digs at his mother in particular he says um something on the lines of anybody who dies while fighting is dumb and so obviously to hope that's like are you literally now calling my dead mother a dumbass and i was in hysterics like i'm totally down for this story it's so stupid and hilarious and i'm like i'm on with it but it's not well written it's not. It's not well written because there are points that are happening with the story where I'm just like, what are we doing then? And why are we doing it? And a big point of that is Lightning's <sighs> realization. Let's call it Lightning's realization. While Lightning and Hope are having these discussions about snow, and then Lightning comes to the realization when we're about to kill Carbuncle. My god, there's a suggestion that we're about to kill Carbuncle, and Carbuncle is a Lassie which is essentially a god, but a silent one, because we find out that only Eden is the one that is communicating with people. The rest of them sort of live silently and just sort of provide for the people. They provide the sunlight, they provide the wind, which I assume is Garuda. Uh, and, you know, they provide the environment that we live in and the reason for us to live. Carbuncle provides all the food. And Carbuncle is just chilling in this factory and providing all the food for all the civilians. And the initial idea is like, we should kill Carbuncle and disrupt the food supply. And that'll teach him. And then Lightning's like, wait a minute, what are we doing? <laughs> this isn't right. I, like, this is ridiculous. And I'm like, you got damn right. We're not just going to kill Carbuncle for this. And uh, then Lightning realizes almost that like, there's no point in fighting. And she's not really sure who the enemy is anymore. So we then continue to fight everybody. And I'm like, wait, what are we doing now then? So are we not going to save Sarah or <laughs> defeat Cocoon, rescue Cocoon or do whatever? And she's just like, I don't even know where I want to go anymore. And Hope's like, what the, f what are we doing then? And it's like, and, and then you break it up with gameplay. So you just continue smashing the factory up. Shout outs here to the best enemy in a video game of all time. The Flanators. The Flanators are a cross between Flans and Janitors, and they have an ability called Rescue, where if somebody on the uh, opposing team, part of their little crew, is damaged, they will cast Rescue, which is a heal, but when they do so, they set off a police sign. <laughs> Police siren! Oh man, I love them! And they can get caught in an endless loop of healing each other and just going woo, woo 
were, it was, I, I mean, I think everybody watching then, including myself, just could not stop laughing at the absurdity of these enemies. And if they only exist in this one room, I will be so sad because I haven't seen them since. We had like three fights with them and they are hysterical because they're so absurd. They're so ridiculous. And there's no way in playtesting people weren't like, what have we done? This clearly is dumb. <laughs> And they're just constantly setting off police sirens. So much, in fact, that the sound effect doesn't even finish before they set up another one. And it's just relentless. And all you can do is be laughing as you're trying to attack them. And they're just healing each other and just setting off these sirens. Oh my god, it's so fun. It's so, so fun. Um, Lightning then has these flashbacks of the, her birthday. Uh, her birthday where her sister is trying to celebrate with her. But on that day... It's the same day that her sister announces that she's become a Lassie, so she's cursed. She's either going to be a ghoul or a crystal. Uh, and also that she's marrying Snow. And obviously, Lightning does not take this well on her birthday and literally says, worst birthday ever. Uh, like, such a teen drama. I was like, oh, right, Lightning? It's the worst. I can't believe they stole my thunder on my birthday, bro. Like, this is the worst, you know? I was just about to have a good day and have some cake. No, bring this on me. Um, and Sarah has given her this knife. Like, and... <laughs> This knife is the last gift her potentially dead sister gave her on her birthday. A few days ago, right? That Lightning feels terrible about what's happened. Her sister is now an ashtray. And this is the last thing that her sister gave to her on her birthday a few days ago. And Lightning just gives it away to Hope. And I immediately went, did you just give away... The final thing that your sister gave you on your birthday where before she essentially died and you've given it away like three days later. It's just ridiculous. That would never happen. At least unless lightning is the worst. Uh, that would never. It was just like, here, this will remind you that hope always exists. But I might be called hope. But there is no hope. Like, <laughs> it's so absurd. So ridiculous. So that whole storyline is going on. Saz and Vanilla are the most amazing people in the game because their plan is to just not fight anything because they're not soldiers and going intentionally into danger zones is really stupid and I fully empathize with that situation. <laughs> they look at like, oh, there's all the soldiers flying towards the city. Uh, it's called Polumpulus. It's based on the twins from 4. Um, and they go, well, we should just not go that way then. And Saz goes, yeah, you're right. Let's just not go that way because that's where all the soldiers are. And they're like, let's go to Nautilus. That's over this way. And they just go on their merry way. But their story, Vanilla was my number one character. She's so full of happiness and charm. And she tries to put a positive spin on things. I try desperately to ignore her run animation, which is the most criminal animation that any animator has ever made in their lives. Um, but she, she... In the first part of the game, she came across as clearly she's a pulse, right? She's from Pulse, and she constantly has to listen to the rest of them who have been indoctrinated about how evil she is. She's corrupted. She's a monster. Uh, people, even though all this is happening in Cocoon with the massacres and things, it's Pulse's fault is how they're brought about to think about it. It's like, yeah, we're being massacred, but this is all because of Pulse. If Pulse didn't exist, we wouldn't be being corrupted. We wouldn't be thought to be corrupted. Like, this is all still Pulse's fault in their minds. Um, it's got good political motivation in that way. It's like, even though you can clearly see who is uh, causing the problem. Like, the government is the one that's, like, massacring civilians. Is They're still indoctrinated to the point that it's not the government's fault that's, like, causing this. It's actually because of these people. Uh, and they still kind of believe that. Well, clearly she's a pulse, so she's dealing with that um, problem of, like, constantly being told that she's a monster and she's responsible for everything. But then we get the cutscene that Saz is a father, and his young son, Daj, uh, has been chosen by a pulse Lassie. And what apparently happened is that uh, he wanted to go on a trip to see a Lassie, because they're obviously all over the place. And Saz took his son to the power plant, where I can't remember who's there. It's Phoenix or somebody... Uh, is, is one of the Lassies that's there. I can't remember who it was. But then the cutscene reveals that Vanilla was there uh, when something went wrong and there was an attack by the Pulse at the power plant. And as Saz is looking for his son, he finds that his son is like unconscious and has been chosen by a Pulse Lassie. And Vanilla was there first. And so it's very obvious that this Pulse attack on the power plant, Vanilla was a part of. 
uh, and is kind of uh, in some way responsible for the fact that Saz's son has been chosen and at this point may be a ghoul or maybe a crystal himself and he doesn't really know uh, what's going on. And he's, his son, for all intents and purposes, his son is dead as far as he's considered and Vanilla's responsible and she's not saying anything. And I'm like, I'm starting to change my mind on her because I'm like, oh, you're going full of Rianjays that you're just not going to reveal things. There was a couple of opportunities where she wants to tell him, but she didn't. Uh, so that's uh, an ongoing story going on with those guys. When it comes to King Snow, we get more revelations of our king, uh, who's going to save everybody because he's the hero. First revelation is the bike that Shiva turns into. The, I told you about the twin sisters of Shiva, which are their Eidolons. The bike is literally where Snow sits, and I only caught it in this cutscene, and everybody else already knew about this apparently, is his crotch l lies between the breasts almost like it would be a, a he would be very able if aroused to nestle his uh, uh phallus uh between the twin perks but also that the face of one of the sisters stares at you while it happens picture this kind of motion uh and i was like wait is this a and i can't say the words on youtube but is this a uh mountain jerk bike and it totally is it absolutely is it is exactly that and i think the other face faces the butthole i can't be sure on that one uh <laughs> let's just say questionable questionable but now snow has teamed up with the other half of the government which are the guardian corps which includes fang and fang is also a pulse who is like helping them out so it looks like the guardian corps are kind of seeing through the political jargon and don't agree with the massacres and things because they probably have a greater understanding that the pulse aren't bad people and this is all kind of a lie and we're all in servitude to eden essentially who i assume is going to be the big finale boss of this game uh because eden's obviously very manipulative and telling them what's going on and probably has i, I i'm guessing right now story-wise eden who is the leader f f uh f he the leader Lassie of Cocoon is probably at war with the leader of the Pulse Lassie, uh, who might turn out to be ha Bahamut or something like that. Like, I think that's what's going on here is that those two are actually at war and they're both like, essentially they're going with a god and devil approach where Eden is the angelic looking, you know, all white and pristine and glowing, is whispering in the ears of all these people and something similar is happening in Pulse or maybe Pulse is trying to reason with them or whatever. I think that's where we're going in the story. But that's where we're up to with a lot of drama on the way and just, just insane. Insane. But I'm enjoying the hell out of 13. I know people keep asking, it's like, when are you going to start hating it? Like we did with 15. Uh, so far, not there. We are on chapter 8. I don't know how many there is, but to give you context of where we are. Uh, and I'm still having a great time. And the combat system is doing super well. So there you go. I'll see you again, guys. Bye-bye.